That's it. All right, hello. Today we are doing our interview for the American Association of Food Safety and Public Health Veterinarians. And our, our person that we're interviewing is Dr. Joseph Anelli. And I want to uh, welcome you, Joe. And can you please tell me where you are at at this point? Where in the United States are you? Yeah, hi, Donna. Um, I'm in the same place I was when I was working for uh, USDA. I'm just outside of Frederick, Maryland. Oh, OK. So all the way on the east, which is fun for us figuring out what time we're always going to meet. I love this uh, little challenge in my life. I am all the way on the Pacific uh, Northwest area, Washington State, on beautiful Whidbey Island. And mm. it is actually rather beautiful today, although super cold. So I don't know about you, but it's cold out here. And I'm avoiding that. <laughs> so tell me, what is it that brought you to veterinary medicine? This is my favorite question to start out with. Um, how did you how did you decide to be a veterinarian or did you just fall into it? What what's your story about that? Well, kind of interesting. I um, I was in high school in the 70s and went to a technical high school that uh, I majored in electronics. And okay. I would go into electronics. And this was, mm -hmm. um, you know, right before personal computers were invented. Uh, it was just the advent of the semiconductor instead of um, uh, tube, vacuum tubes in radios and, and so on. So transistors were, were a big thing. And it was what mm -hmm. I wanted to do. And um, I decided that I wanted to. Uh, volunteer at a hospital and work in the area of electronics and medical uh, equipment. Equipment. Mm -hmm. And I had a, um, an interview with somebody who asked me what electronics had to do with medicine. And I was like, uh, have you ever heard of x-ray machines or <laughs> EKGs? Or... And, and they finally got it. And I worked there for, uh, for a summer and enjoyed the medicine part of that as much as I did the, uh, the electronics part of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and then as I um, started to graduate from college, my interest started to move from the electronics piece to the medicine piece. So where, where were you going to college at that time? In Brooklyn, New York. Ah, okay. Mm-hmm. So, and that's, that's why I went to Brooklyn Technical High School, which was that electronics thing, and then decided to switch from electronics to biology. So going to college, I was a biology major, thinking about going into um, veterinary medicine. Uh, I didn't want to do human medicine. I would prefer to have kept the people out of the office if you could do that. Right. Um, <laughs> let's all just practice. admit that now as veterinarians, let's all admit it right from the get go. That right. is exactly what it was. Yes. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, uh, I, I had my biology degree and um, applied to Cornell University because back then you could really mm -hmm. only apply to the, the college in your in your state or a contracting state so the only place i was really eligible, eligible. To apply yeah. was cornell mm -hmm. and um, i had an interview and was told that they have such a backlog of qualified applicants that it would probably take two or three years before they could even consider accepting me wow. so i i ended up um taking a job as a high school biology teacher so, so let me let me ask you then. You're you're you actually got an interview to vet school. Yes. And they told you that it that it wouldn't it'd be a while before right. you could get in years. Right. Wow. I I did not realize it was that it was like that when we all knew it was. Yeah, getting an interview is hard. But once you got the interview, it was pretty much almost a done deal that you would get accepted. Although there were those few who got the letter, no, you didn't. So you were yeah. told, hey, there's a good chance, but it's going to be a few years. And right. being the good person that you were, like, I got to keep working because now that school, that's done. You, you went into becoming a teacher. You were able to qualify to being a teacher at that time. Right. Yep. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, 
what I was doing for my summers was working at a veterinary hospital. So oh, okay. I had summers off as a teacher. So I was working at a veterinary hospital while I was teaching. And I started to like the work at the veterinary hospital more than I did the teaching. Oh, sure. And, uh, it, it just so happened that one summer, a guy showed up that was in school in the Philippines and mm -hmm. he was working for their summer break in the same hospital. And I was talking to him about my experience with Cornell. And, you know, I, I was, I don't know, 25, 26 at the time, married, not maybe getting into vet school until I was 30, getting out at 34, you know, all of that kind of my life passing me by while waiting to get in. And he said, well, I probably could get you accepted into the Philippines for the next school year. Wow. Uh, I Talk thought, about serendipitous. Right. <laughs> I did not know that was even possible. I, I'd heard of, was it St. George University? But I did not know about the Philippines. Yeah, sure. there were some Caribbean universities. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, in, in New York City, a number of the veterinarians that I worked with went to school in Italy. Oh, yes. I did know some veterinarians who did that. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. And mm -hmm. um, so, so this guy said he could probably get me accepted the next year. And when he went back to the Philippines, he'd have them send me an application. Mm -hmm. So he sent me the application and I didn't know what I wanted to do. Did I want to apply again for Cornell? Cornell, Cornell was terribly expensive as well. I probably oh my gosh. couldn't I've have heard. afforded it on just student loans. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you had a family. And I had a family. Yeah. Uh, no children yet. And um, I had the application sitting around the house for a couple of weeks. And I remember it clearly. I woke up in the middle of the night and decided I'm going to go. And I, um, I filled out the application. And when my wife woke up, I told her that I was going to go to the Philippines and, and go to veterinary school. And she said, well, you know, if you're going to do that, you're going to go do that on your own. That I'm not going to go with you. So I, I'm, I was still committed enough to do it that I was going to go to the, the Philippines by myself and, mm. uh, and do this thing. And mm -hmm. uh, about a month or two later, I got um, an, a, um, an acceptance letter from the school in the Philippines. Oh, okay. And I told my wife I'd gotten accepted. And she's like, well, when do we leave? I'm like, what do you mean, oh. when do we leave? She said, yeah, I'm not going to let you go without me. I needed to make sure it was what you wanted to do. <laughs> that you were oh willing gosh. to give up all of this. No. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, Oh, wow. So we both, both left for the Philippines. The uh, school was in English. Yeah, um, okay. There were other Good. American students there. And the school mm -hmm. had a policy that they would not accept more than um, 10 Americans a year because they didn't want it to be a, uh, a diploma mill kind of thing. And, and they were going to limit the number of, uh, of foreign students. So I did that for... Uh, for three years and then was able to do my senior year of clinical rotations at the University of Tennessee. Oh, so I, interesting, okay. Mm -hmm. So I went to UT for my, my last year mm -hmm. uh, of vet school. And- um, And you graduated when? 1984. Okay, right around, I did round then too, 83 for me. Too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So, um, and, and all I ever wanted to do was small animal practice, you know, sure. growing up in New York City, it was kind of all I, all I knew. Uh -huh. And uh, what I'd been doing then, you know, at that point for years as a technician, and then uh, finished vet school, my wife was still in graduate school in Tennessee. So I was in uh, small animal practice in Tennessee for a while. Mm -hmm. Then when she, uh, she finished, we moved back to New York City. And, uh, and I started working in a, in a veterinary practice in New York City that happened to be down the street from a, an army fort where they stage people before sending them to Germany. Mm -hmm. So I had a lot of clients coming in looking for international health certificates to bring their dogs to Germany. Oh, that's, yeah, that's still a big deal. Mm -hmm. Sure. So, so with... Um, with all of my 
travels, you know, worldwide, and then Tennessee, and then mm -hmm. up to New York, I had never taken the accreditation exam. Mm -hmm. So I needed to take the accreditation exam to be able to sign all the international health certificates. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, uh, USDA had a port veterinarian office um, at Kennedy Airport, and they said they could schedule a, a time for me to go take the accreditation exam. This is back when they were doing an exam. Sure. Take the exam out at, uh, at Kennedy Airport. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I took a day off from practice where I had been working six days a week, probably 12 hours a day. You know, by, mm -hmm. by this time, I, I had a young daughter who was... Um, asleep when I left for work in the morning and asleep again when I got home from work in the in the evening. It's still like that. Still yeah. like that, Joe. Yeah, go ahead. So I, uh, I go out to this Kennedy Airport office and I take the exam. And when I finish the exam, the port veterinarian says to me, you wouldn't be interested in a job with the federal government, would you? <laughs> and I'm like, well, no, not really, but tell me about it. Bankers so hours. <laughs> yeah, he starts to tell me about it. Yeah, exactly. The you mean I only work from like eight to four thirty, and that's like five days a week. Um, federal holidays. Sick yeah, days. federal holidays. <laughs> well, Back in the day, me, yeah, federal yeah. jobs were fantastic, right? Mm -hmm. He's he's talking to me, and he's dialing the telephone, and I'm thinking, how rude. I mean, he's talking to me, and he's on the phone and he says, hello, Dr. Toms, I have someone here interested in the position. <laughs> <laughs> Sits me down at his desk and, and I basically had my interview for my federal position right there. Oh. <laughs> and, uh, I can't even. <laughs> yeah. And I, I remember saying at the time that, you know, one of the things I would kind of expect out of this is that there would be an opportunity to get a graduate degree oh. and, you know, and this sort sure. of stuff. And he said, well, yeah. those are some so, so which agency were you working for specifically? Because we, we know Department of Agriculture then has uh, several agencies underneath that. And so what, what, what you were USDA. I was yes. USDA APHIS. APHIS. Okay veterinary yes. services but veterinary services at the time did all of the work that the animal care group does now as well so so i had the the interesting title of section veterinarian for new york city and long island oh you were back home i was too. back home yep. what what oh. Geez, so there's was, some nice things. Th these were all unplanned activities. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so so my uh, advice to, to somebody, you know, now is, you know, don't be locked in to veterinary medicine being just one thing for you. Be open to whatever opportunities happen to come your way, you know. Yeah, Sarah, and you know, I, I got to go to the Philippines and, you know, come back and do my senior year in Tennessee. Uh, and then fell into this USDA job, which it, which is 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 really uh, about keeping your your eyes and dare I say your heart open because you have to be willing to to take that leap if if you see these opportunities. Now, granted, you probably didn't take other opportunities that came by because it didn't you know really speak to you. But this was because you have a young family you you want to be able to interact with them and i and i tell you i'm on several facebook groups with young veterinarians particularly and they talk about that and they they are struggling um they talk about how they spend so much time uh, day in day out doing what they love as a veterinarian but then they are again having to have that ongoing pull to be all that for their family yeah and so here you were, it, it, dare I say, and, and that's unusual, you know, a lot of fathers are like, nope, got to go to work. That's my job. That's <laughs> it. You know, um, and they're not necessarily uh, uh, mindful that they may have uh, an enormous effect on their family if they do participate. And so here, 
you were thinking about that and and you went into the world of oh my gosh i have not talked to anybody i believe yet who's worked for aphis so you have to tell me about that ah okay so the um the interesting thing about why taking the job with aphis made sense was not just the the hours that i was putting in that even on my day off the vet that was covering for me would call me constantly about cases that were in the hospital and that sort of thing. But um, the, uh, the interesting thing was that I felt like a toy repairman. You know, the poodle walked in with a bad knee. I could fix the knee and that was fine. You know, I, I helped the, the little old lady with her poodle and, and that was good. But I wanted to have a greater impact on things. And in that one hour conversation with the guy who was the area veterinarian in charge, mm -hmm. I got that sense that I had the, the opportunity to affect things on a more global scale than just the poodle that I could fix. Right. And, and that's what I found with, uh, with APHIS that uh, I, it, it seems odd that I was the veterinarian for New York City, but New York City had the largest number of research facilities in the country. You know, all of the major universities on Manhattan had multiple research facilities. So I, um, I spent um, a couple of years working with research facilities. I got to meet Nobel laureates. Um, I, I got to, to meet Barbara McClintock and explain that she wasn't taking care of her animals properly. You know, stuff like that that was really kind of cool. Well, this and, was also the beginning of when lab veterinary certification became a thing, as I recall. Yeah, early mm -hmm. 80s, yep, yeah. mid 80s. Yeah. And um, so it was really very, very interesting stuff that I got to do, got to review some of the research that people were doing. You know, this was early on when uh, green monkeys had an immunodeficiency disease and they didn't quite know what it was. Uh, and, and got to see those sort of amazing kinds of things. Um, met, met one guy uh, and was talking about, you know, animal care and use issues with him. And, uh, and he said, well, you know, I, I've written on almost every, anything. I mean, name a, name a topic. And I, I would be like, what? Uh -huh. And he said, no, I mean, in the area of biology, just name a topic. And I would name something and he would go reach for a textbook that he wrote a chapter on, on that topic. It was just amazing stuff that I got to I'm deal boggling. with. Um, and then um, he, he, you know, one of the places that I, I inspected was the um, Coldstream Harbor Laboratory. And that got mentioned and, and he said like, well, Jimmy, Jimmy's not a scientist anymore. Jimmy's just an administrator. And I'm like, Jimmy, Jimmy who? Jimmy Watson of the Watson and Crick model um, was, was the, the director of the Coldstream Harbor Lab. So those were the kinds of people that I got to, to deal with early on in my career with APHIS. And then uh, one day I got a call from that same AVIC who said, Joe, we've got this avian influenza outbreak in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And they just traced one of the trucks to New York City. and." Um, I'm sure those birds are dead by now. They're long gone. They've, they've gone into New York City. We just need you to go check and make sure that that was a slaughter plant and these birds are in fact dead. So I uh, drove over to the, uh, the location that they had given me and no, it was not a slaughter plant. It was a loading dock. Trucks from Maine to Georgia would arrive on one side of the loading dock with spent hens and other poultry. They would take them off those trucks and redistribute them onto smaller trucks that were delivered to 40 live bird markets in New York City and Long Island. Oh. So ever heard about the uh, live bird markets in Hong Kong and China? It was the exact same situation in New York City and New Jersey. Oh, wow. So I ended up sitting on top of this largest outbreak of avian influenza in, in New York City that they had ever discovered and, uh, and ended up with just two years of experience running a major disease eradication program for, for uh, New York City and New Jersey. 
I, I bet just, you, I, <laughs> I bet you were busy with that all the time. I have friends who yes. are in the middle of still dealing with the uh, outbreak, the early or well, I guess last year now. Yeah. So wow. Oh yeah. That's my and, well. It's still going on. Yeah. 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 Still going on. So yeah. Uh, yeah it was it was an interesting. Um, amazing experience working for APHIS, going from these research facilities with some of the, the top-notch people in, uh, in, in biology and, and science, then working on this major disease eradication outbreak, which was just wonderful. And then um, I got noticed by people in APHIS that I was able to deal with those kinds of things. Uh -huh. and I got a phone call one day, again, this serendipitous kind of thing. Right. And yeah. Hey, we're starting a new eradication program for pseudorabies, uh, pseudorabies mm -hmm. in swine. Swine. And, mm -hmm. uh, and we're starting a, a graduate training program to get somebody trained up on pigs because everybody else who worked for APHIS with pigs worked on the hog cholera, classical swine fever program, and they'd all been retiring. That was finished in the 70s. Sure. So this was, you know, years after that, and they didn't have anybody else really trained in pigs. So uh, at first I said, no, I, you know, I, I'm too new. It's not time for me to go do that yet. Well, they kept bugging me about doing it. And mm -hmm. I, I finally applied and got accepted to the program and went to the University of Minnesota, stayed there for four years doing a graduate degree. Oh, so in you my, ended up going there and your graduate degree was in what? Uh, it was two things. It was veterinary epidemiology, but all of my coursework was taken in the School of Public Health in Minneapolis, and all of my research was done at the veterinary school in St. Paul. So it was a wonderful combination of, if you will, One Health, <laughs> where I did all the public health stuff on one side, and I did all the um, veterinary medicine stuff on the other, majored in swine was the national swine epidemiologist for uh, for a while for USDA and just had uh, you know again a, a wonderful new part of my career where you know I, I didn't do the research facilities anymore and I didn't do the the major disease outbreak stuff but I did a 10-year eradication program for uh, for a swine disease and, you, and so this is such an interesting thought, though. Veterinarians are able to go uh, from, here you were, small animal clinician. That was what you thought you'd do, get into. Okay, and now you're going sort of research lab animals, dare I say. And now there's a leap straight up to concerns with livestock and yep. the, the impact that uh, pseudorabies would have on um on our uh food supply essentially as yeah. well yeah. yeah and so uh, but but you're able to pivot and do all and that's because veterinarians really do have that broad base of knowledge that uh is is really exceptional for us isn't it so yeah. so that that point being in working with the government um as i recall you know when i ended up working for the government but of course it was department of defense as the army i had I, I was able to enjoy a great uh, deal of, of financial security for my family. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that 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 um, the government work um, provided that more than anything ever did before for, for, for me and my family. It really leveled things up. Did, did you would you say that be the same for you? Yeah, it, it did. It, um, you know, where I was in private practice, um, yeah, I was salaried at the time, you know, for who I was working for, but certainly the, uh, the clientele would vary significantly. So, you know, the, uh, the, the salary didn't really go up very much. It, uh, mm -hmm. whereas with, uh, with the federal government, I could be assured of a pay increase kind of on an annual basis. Uh, there were opportunities that, you know, where in private practice, if I had to work late, I didn't get paid any extra for it right. with the federal government. If I had to work late and I did quite often in New York, because being near Kennedy Airport, there was a lot of um, equine <laughs> importations 
uh, particularly to New York because of some major race and race. so on. <clears throat> yeah. So we constantly had horses coming in from, from various parts of the world and they would arrive late at night. So I was making a lot of overtime at night. So even if I was leaving the family you know, for the evening, I was getting paid extra for it. So there was mm -hmm. something that made up for that. And that, got paid uh, time off, had holidays. Right. Yeah, paid there was, off, right? yeah, all Didn't of those have to things worry that about you answering get. The phone. Yeah. You know, and, and now that this is a, a big deal within um, corporate medicine is, well, you get these kinds of things as well. Um, you know, but how does that play out? We see people who uh, who who are getting those those entitlements and benefits. Um, but but where does that that lead you for the opportunity to get like you said here, you got an advanced another degree in um, your your master's in public health. And, ep and right. epidemiology. So right. you had that combination. And you, I'm sure, were able to advance in terms of your GS level and, you know, so forth. You advance within the... I, again, I, I, I think I got very lucky that um, the two people that were running the swine program for USDA mm -hmm. were both of retirement age. So they wanted to get someone like me through graduate school and then working on the staff level mm -hmm. for a number of years before each of them retired. And um, I was able to get promoted right into a GS-15 level because they retired. Yeah. Um, and, and I was the best qualified with swine medicine, in fact, maybe one of the very few that mm. had the swine medicine background to be the, uh, the director of the uh, swine health staff. So at that point, where are we at um, in terms of what year um, was that? And you were in Minnesota at that time. Is that where we're up to? I was in Minnesota. Uh -huh. Then in order to learn the, the Washington, D.C. aspects of that job, the, the more policy stuff instead of the scientific stuff, I moved to Washington in around 1991 or two and started working for staff in, uh, in Washington in about 92. And then uh, sort of serendipitously, those other people retired, and I was able to move up into that um, director's position in, in about three years. So by like 1995, I was a GS-15. In fact, I think I may have been one of the youngest GS-15s at the time that they mm -hmm. uh, that they ever promoted. Mm -hmm. so, and that was that, and that was within all within APHIS. Essentially, you kept that yes. career directory in there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's what was wonderful is that I, I still had the same employer. I still had the same kind of organizational structure, but I had very different positions. So I switched positions maybe once every four or five years and, and got kind of a whole new um, perspective on things and got to do a whole lot of new and different things every five years or so. So what you're saying so, is that it didn't get boring which is no, really important not. to veterinarians. That's one of the things we love in clinical practice as a rule, you know, things are different. Oh, something comes in every day is different. And so what you're saying is that that still provides that same type of variety and interest to keep you engaged and enjoying what you were doing. Right. But the, yeah. but the, the, the stability of the, the same organization in a way. So, yep. so uh, Washington D.C. Oh my gosh, you guys really did travel. What? What? How long were you there? Well, well finished my career in in Washington. So I was in Washington until 2018. I guess it would be. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, but again, got to do lots of different things. Um, Back during the Clinton administration, there was a move to having a uh, su uh, supervisory ratio of one to 15. So the small swine staff that I had that was only five people needed to change. So they, um, they combined my staff with another staff and, and I was then managing both of those. 
Mm -hmm. And I had programs going from um, Scrapey, Brucellosis, no, not Brucellosis, Scrapey, um, uh, Aquaculture, the Swine Diseases staff, and I'm not even quite sure, there were a couple of others, but I ended up managing like 23 people. And um, so, so it gave me a complete kind of across the board experience of working with all these various programs and working with people that were, you know, the experts in their fields in, in each of these uh, disease programs that APHIS was running. All so right, was, so uh, altogether, um, how many years then were, were you in APHIS and, and what exactly was the final title and division that you okay. were at? So I was there for 32 years total. Oh, okay. And um, in about 1998, the person who was lead for our emergency program staff was called back to uh, active duty. He was a reservist uh -huh, and yeah. needed to, to leave for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And I was asked to take on the emergency management program for APHIS. Mm -hmm. So I moved from that, that group of um, swine health and, and miscellaneous programs to the emergency programs division and uh, ended up helping to introduce the incident command system into uh, APHIS. Okay. And worked with the forest service to, to bring that skill set into, uh, into APHIS. This was right at the same time that uh, we had a, a BSE situation happening in your great state of Washington mm -hmm. and uh, got to, to manage a BSE program, got to manage a monkeypox outbreak, got to work on avian influenza outbreaks uh, multiple times and, uh, and did that for about five years. We also had the um, uh, exotic Newcastle disease outbreak in California. That, oh, uh, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember uh, that. I and many others were responsible for. And uh, at around this same time, there was an avian influenza H5N1 outbreak in Hong Kong mm. that infected people. And this was the first time that we had um, people being infected directly from chickens. You know, ordinarily the influenza cycle seemed to be birds to swine, swine to people. Well, this time it was jumping from poultry to people. Okay. And uh, there was a great deal of concern internationally about what was happening and that this was at least off the US shore at the time. And uh, I ended up working on um, avian influenza globally um, mm -hmm. was was on detail with the undersecretary's office and worked at the White House on avian influenza. So uh, part of my, uh, my career was, was working at the White House on uh, pandemic preparedness and, uh, and avian influenza and running uh, an international disease eradication program, which was just an amazing full circle for me because I was in Vietnam working on uh, on avian influenza and talking to people about how to manage poultry in Southeast Asia and mm -hmm. getting these talks about, you know, what's this white guy from America know about raising chickens in Southeast Asia? And I would say, I used to raise chickens in the Philippines the same way you do. And I know exactly what you're doing and why these, are, these disease is spreading. So it was like, oh, wow, all of a sudden, this experience from the Philippines came and, back. In and the right there, that, that, is, that is really true about life. We, we are the accumulation of all these experiences at this time. And, yeah. and so you were able to draw on that successfully. And, and I wonder if the policies and procedures you put into place back then are, were pretty much enacted recently, shall I say, <laughs> recently. Actually, Without what... What we worked on in uh, the avian influenza and pandemic preparedness plan had a program for school closures in it that we had See. developed. Now it was implemented 
not the way we had intended it, but it was it was already written long before the COVID-19 outbreak started. And, uh, and there were a lot of things that actually were implemented uh, in COVID that we had put together before that. Wow. Which was yeah. really exciting to see. Yeah. Yeah. And, and to see that it, it was and, and successfully, hopefully, that, you know, to know that uh, it, it did work out, it did play out correctly. So uh, let's fast forward then to retirement. My gosh, so many years that we practice and then go into whatever different kinds of uh, manifestations of our career. Um, yeah. you, so you had your, your, you had your master's and, and I, I saw that you, uh, you do consulting now. Can you tell me how that even evolved? Because you know, a lot of times people say, oh, I'm like retired, you know, that, that's it. But clearly, Clearly, you you didn't say that's it. What what happened next? And then and then how I know you as a fellow president. Now I'm past president of the and and please touch on that as well. But retirement in 2018. Then how did you reimagine your yourself at that point? Well, right right before retirement, when I was um, finishing the work that I was doing at the White House, we also created a new one health staff within USDA. So, uh, so I was working the one health um, aspects of a uh, multi-agent. Oh, I think I lost Joseph. I'm gonna halt the recording, just to record. Good, okay. And uh, so it was coming up on, 2018, and you were coming uh, up to the time for uh, retirement. We had a little break here in the action, but uh, go ahead if you can tell us, uh, Joe, uh, what what came into fruition at that point for you to choose the retirement and go on to the next uh, the next time in your career. Oh, let me uh, see if you can unmute. There we go. Let's try that again. Oh, there. Good. Okay, you got it. You're good. Okay, no problem. Go ahead. So yeah, uh, while working at the White House, I, I started this, this One Health office within USDA and um, decided uh, as I turned 65 that I would, return, I would retire on my 65th birthday. Well, which is what I, I did. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, no, that's not right. It was my 62nd birthday. Mm. It was my 62nd birthday when I, when I retired. And um, it, it, the day after I retired, I ended up on an airplane to the World Health Organization where I was consulting on a, uh, a document for zoonotic diseases that they were writing. Oh, so, is World Health, um, is that in France? Where, where, Geneva. Where, Geneva, okay, Switzerland, Geneva. okay. Mm -hmm. yep. wow. so, um, so that was pretty exciting that, uh, Gosh, that yeah. I was retiring, but I wasn't actually stopping working. I was just doing the things that were fun. Uh, instead of, you know, the things that I didn't like to do, I didn't have to do. Mm -hmm. So I did that for a while. And, um, and then uh, had an opportunity, uh, this time with the Food and Agriculture Organization, they invited me to speak on, uh, on One Health at a, uh, a conference they were holding in Bangkok. So <laughs> got to travel to Bangkok and, uh, and speak at that meeting. Mm -hmm. And then a little while after that, I got this phone call, much like that original call uh -huh. from Mike Gilsdorf. Mike Gilsdorf saying, <clears throat> Joe, had you ever thought about working for the National Association of Federal Veterinarians? And again, I'm like, well, no, but tell me something about it. So we started talking uh, about what, what it would entail, and I didn't want to do something full-time, so this is a part-time job for me. It's like 24 hours a week, mm -hmm. and uh, I was starting to hear that, uh, that there were some tough times going on back for my, uh, my fellow um, veterinarians back in, in APHIS, and that uh, I wanted to give back in some way to be able to help them. 
And this time it was helping them from outside of the, uh, the federal government and be able to have a different kind of influence on, uh, on the policies that uh, the USDA had and, and so on. And, so, and this uh, is something that I don't know that people understand. The National Association of Federal Veterinarians, I belonged to that very briefly when I worked for USDA. And I loved the fact that it, it's an advocacy, right? It right. is, yes, it's about advocacy, yes, yes. Yeah. And so that's where you were able to help from the outside as, yeah. okay. And it's, so it's, it's you explain a, how that worked. Yeah, it's not a union, right. but it is a scientific organization of managers and supervisors. And as such is officially recognized by the Office of Personnel Management <clears throat> to, to be a significant contributor to the policies that affect their programs by representing supervisors and managers to upper leadership. So we have consultations with the administrator's office and the deputy administrator's office on a regular basis mm -hmm. to, um, to help advocate, not just for the personnel issues, but to also advocate for programs. You know, if there are things that would make, uh, would improve programs because our membership is closer to the um, the situation and understand, uh, for example, with food safety and inspection service, if there are ways that food safety and inspection service could improve their inspection processes by improving the way they use their veterinary um, personnel, we can bring that directly to the administrator's office. And well, I'll tell you what they need to do first is take them off the line, not yes. have them substitute for the, the text. Again, this is not about ego, but yeah. uh, but no, that's not a good use of the veterinarian's time to put them on the line as a substitute. Right. When, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's the, all those sorts of things that, uh, that are challenges for them. And um, given the way starting salaries are now, it, the, the federal government is no longer competitive. Not at all. So, yeah. um, so there are... Um, high vacancies within food safety and inspection service. And what NAFV has been able to do working with um, AVMA is to get um, an, an appropriation of funds in the millions of dollars to be able to improve recruitment and retention within food safety and inspection service. So the, the nice thing about my job now is that I can advocate not only at the uh, agency level, but at the congressional level. Oh, so, oh uh, I had no idea. It sounds like uh, you've just made huge strides from when I was involved in 2017. And uh, I, okay. yeah, yeah. And, and uh, my gosh, I tell you, what an incredible training program. Um, that that they that I did get to have and and I'm I'm grateful for that, um, but offline different situation that um, really would have loved to have some advocacy, but that yeah. said I did manage to do that on my own, and so at this yeah. point here you are being able to impact and to help in veterinary medicine and I and I want to make that clear you know veterinarians as a rule they they tend to do this sort of thing. They, they tend to reach a point where they, they say, okay, yeah, I'm retired, but I have so much more that I can do and I can give. And, and, um, and dare I say, you know, I, I myself in that same sort of position. And so, so here you are and, and your title in the organization is what? The executive vice president. Ah, okay. So, uh, we have a, a president a secretary treasurer and a president elect, which make up our um, executive committee. And then I'm the one that sort of runs the organization behind the scenes, carrying out the policies that the executive board would like to see happen and do that along with our, our full board. So we have representatives from APHIS. We have representatives from Food Safety and Inspection Service. We now have enough members from CDC that we have a separate representation for CDC. And then we have a representative for all of the other federal agencies that veterinarians are employed 
uh, anywhere from you know FDA to to NASA has a has a veterinarian working for them. So, mm -hmm. so that's uh, that's a similar structure to to our association as well. Yeah. And so you have these representatives, and they make up your your the rest of your board, and and they help uh, help move ideas and policies forward within the group. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So yeah. fantastic. I'm so glad to see that that uh, you you have accomplished that. Uh, so much, and and you have a very robust organization at this point. Um, how many members, approximately, would you say that you have? Because I remember you guys were <clears throat> significantly bigger than our we, association. We have about eleven hundred members, seven hundred of which are um, uh, full time federal employees. The others, when you retire as an NAFV member, you become a member for life without paying dues. So we've got three or 400 people who are members who have retired previously, and then about 700 members that are uh, our full-time employees currently. Mm -hmm. uh, challenges within the federal service, the number of veterinarians has been declining steadily over the last 10 years, so that, um, that our membership has gone down because just the number of federal veterinarians, uh, there's about 3,000 federal veterinarians um, in federal service, and that's decreased over time. Mm -hmm. So uh, so you took on that role um, around what, what time was that? What year? I think that would be 2019. Mm, OK. So right before COVID hit. Sure, yes. And uh, then um, were you still doing your consulting work or are you still doing your consulting as well? Uh, it, not as much because the, the sort of consulting that I'm doing now is also representing NAFV simultaneously. So I'm, I'm working with, for example, Senator Gillibrand's office with a, a team of people that have written a new piece of legislation that's recently been introduced into Congress called the, the One Health Security Act. So that would be something I would be doing as um, a, a consultant, mm -hmm. but it's also something that fits in perfectly with NAFE's goals of, uh, of ensuring that veterinarians are recognized for their technical expertise in the, the One Health arena. So mm -hmm. we're using that, uh, that relationship with uh, Senator Gillibrand's office to bring forward these concepts that, uh, that veterinarians are, you know, starting salaries for veterinarians are not competitive so that, uh, that, that we're not attracting new people into- No, it's not no, nowhere near where it should be. And yeah. then as I recall, one of the things, the topics that came up in, in training was where a, a number of the younger veterinarians in particular were trying to enter into the, the public uh, forgiveness program, public service forgiveness program. I, I'm sure that I didn't get that completely right, but generally it's when you're working in some element of public service, some sector um, you, for, for 10 years, and they were extremely concerned um, for two things. One, that uh, they it, it kept getting a rumor that it would be lost, that it didn't matter, they could even have five years into it and they, it, 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 they wouldn't have that forgiveness. And, and mind you, I, I know for a fact we're seeing loans for veterinary students and twenty two hundred thousand yeah. dollars or more, maybe even three hundred thousand, which by the way is impossible to pay off, even when you're in uh, clinical practice, which theoretically is the highest paying. Um, it literally takes you either having to get um, uh, somebody else supporting you, and you put your entire paycheck to that, yeah. or um, a public health forgiveness of some sort. Um, you know, or dare I say an inheritance, <laughs> yeah. whatever, but, um, but yes, uh, that, that, that threat was very difficult um, for, for these young people to say, hey, yes, I would be making less money, but in the end, I would have this much paid back. Yeah. So that was a, 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 a tipping point, I think, when, when that became an issue. Am I right? Yeah, uh, it, it has. 
there's there's been a challenge with that program and and AVMA has very fortunately been pushing very hard on on this. Um, one of the challenges with that program was the question as to whether it would exist long term that you could depend on it 10 years down the road. So they're ensuring that that stays high in the uh, in the minds of, of Congress. The other thing is Congress created that program but made the income to pay off the student loan taxable. So the government would give you, you know, let's just use 10,000 as a, as, a, as a number, would give you $10,000 and then take 3,000 out of it for taxes. So yeah. you'd only be getting seven of what looked like 10,000 to you. So right. they've been able to approach um, Congress and, getting that change so that that's no longer taxable. So that's giving about a third of the money back into the program so that there's more money available for loan forgiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the government doesn't have to pay anymore, but they, uh, they end up being able to spread that money a little thinner. Oh, that's good to know. I'm glad we, we, we touched on that today then. Yeah, so thank you. So do you find yourself perhaps giving more time um, than your 24 hours a week? <laughs> Oh, yes. I'm Very just saying well. because I talked to our executive vice president, Dr. Catherine Waters, who, by the way, huge kudos to her. She's so incredible. Um, but yes, yeah, she's, she's wonderful she's, to work with. Yeah, yeah, she is. She's a real, real joy to work with. I, I have actually she's like a best friend now. So, yeah, that said, uh, she <laughs> she's just like I'm, I'm working so much. I have other things I want to do. Do you find yourself looking sometimes longingly like, oh, there's a vacation I would have liked to go on? <laughs> I, I've been, I've been uh, lucky that I've been able to take the vacations that I've wanted to take. Um, uh, okay. Because of my career, I've worked on every continent except Antarctica. So oh. last, last January, uh, at about this time, I was on my way to Antarctica. For oh, a oh, okay. Oh, wow. I had no idea. That's, yep. that's fantastic. That, so, so how long would you say that you would be in this position? Is this something that is a finite time? Like, oh, you serve in this position or is it a job where you are? It's a job. You do this job until you won't or can't or what have you. Yeah, I, I think that's that's pretty much it. You know, the mm -hmm. way I've run the rest of my career, I've done things for about five year blocks. So I figure in this position, I've got another couple of years. Uh, uh -huh. Of course, it's going to depend on finding somebody to replace me that uh, that can continue the the work. That's I think getting harder and harder to do. Um, but, uh, but I think what I need to start doing is sort, sort of grooming some of those people that are going to be coming up and retiring in the next couple of years to think about this as a viable option for when they retire to start doing the advocacy. You know, for me, it's been wonderful, a, a whole government career. And now I'm on the opposite side of that, being able to work with Congress to affect what, uh, what my old agency does. Mm -hmm. So I think there's, there's some real advantages to, to coming up and seeing a position like the uh, executive vice president of NAFV as a very viable um, position, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and part-time makes it nice that you can still do the things you want to do in retirement, but yet continue to contribute to, uh, to the veterinary profession. As a whole, yes, that's right. I, I hear uh, from a number of, of uh, fellow veterinarians that have done this kind of thing. They get into organized medicine, which is what we call being in these associations, and they find that giving back is uh, something that uh, is satisfying personally, but also it, sat it satisfi satisfies our personal desire to be of service. Right. And, and I see that a lot in veterinarians. That's an underlying theme as well. So now you've, you've said, yes, uh, I'm going to keep my eye out much. like <laughs> You're going to be that phone call to somebody <laughs> like Mike Gilsorf did to you, by the yes. way, Mike did a really wonderful interview too. Oh my gosh. You oh, good. Yeah. I want to yeah. say he was somewhere in the 
first few that I that we did. Wow. Um, and so, yes, you, you're going to be that person to make that phone call. <laughs> yes, I see that coming. And and you're right. When I I did the same thing, um, I looked I looked as I came into the uh, president elect position. Uh, which is fully volunteer, of course, and then said, okay, who's going to follow? And to me, it was important to get in young blood into the organization. So yeah. I looked for, for, for people and encouraged getting in people who were uh, significantly younger and with the idea in mind that, uh, that we would have that sustainability. Now with you, you have automatically high numbers because of uh, the, the, the organization's that you represent, the, <laughs> it, it's not a matter of, you know, like, oh, no, they're in government work. They should join yeah. this organization, yeah. like we all sort of automatically join AVMA. But um, with uh, American Association of Food Safety and Public Health Veterinarians, it's pretty much, nope, there's, <laughs> we're not necessarily going to have a shoe in for members. Um, yeah. That said, um, here we are at that point, um, looking back, what would you say is your your best um, comments or or significant things you've learned to say to it, it, you want to say to the younger people? Like as an example, twofold. I believe this um, series that we're doing is going to affect and help people who are at that point in their career as a veterinarian. There there's something else. They they're just they're they're stuck burnt out, what have you. Um, so career changes, and also those people who are looking at getting into veterinary medicine. And as you said, USDA, so on, APHIS, they all have um, a, a place to, to welcome younger veterinarians to get into to work. So here you are, you're, you're, you're able to say these different things. What, what do you have to say to these two somewhat disparate groups of, of people? So the advice that I was given, and I think is, is excellent to pass along, is that you need to go into private practice first. You need to do that for a little bit. You need to kind of get that out of your system so that you're not wondering the rest of your life what that would have been like. Mm -hmm. Once you do that, you recognize that there are lots of, there's lots of satisfaction you get from that but it also gives you a sense of what to appreciate when you turn in your scalpel for a pen and you start working on policy issues instead of the single surgeries and you start working on that broader scale of things. And the, the advice there is that you need to have patience. Hmm. When, you, when you're doing surgery, you pretty much get instantaneous results when you're done. Yeah. When you're doing policy work, the seeds you plant one year may not come to fruition for five years or 10 years, but you mm -hmm. need to keep at it and keep moving those things forward and, and stay committed to, um, to the values that you believe you need to, um, to put forward and keep working on those because it's going to take a long time for, to get those things to come to fruition. So don't ever give up, keep pushing those. Uh, you know, I've done that with the One Health Agenda and, uh, and it's gone through lots of, of iterations, but we now have a, uh, a piece of legislation that's been introduced into Congress called the One Health Security Act. So wow. it's, it's sort of coming to fruition and it's got many of my visions for how a One Health program in the United States should, uh, should unfold. And, and I think it's going to be really good for um, the veterinary profession and really good for public health. So, so for those veterinarians who are starting out, the sure, get into um, private practice for a bit. And, um, and if you have your eye on, on something else in a different area of veterinary medicine, how, how could they seek those types of positions, I remember, oh my gosh, I was on AVMA Career Center <laughs> daily, three times a day. So when I was looking to do something different out of clinical practice and my gosh, the slim pickings on there. So you, you mentioned early on about networking 
And networking is the way to make that happen. Something that NAFV is doing with its, its redesign of a, um, of a website and its, its membership directory is to create a better opportunity for uh, interacting with various members. So we have, um, we have uh, opportunities for private practitioners and students to become a, an affiliate member of NAFV to be able to have access to that network and be able to put out questions like, I'm interested in a job you know, in, in Wyoming mm -hmm. with um, you know, USDA. And there will be people in those positions in Wyoming who can, can then respond to you and give you some advice on what positions are available. Oh, that's incredible. I had no idea that, that you, you were able to do that in an AFE, none yeah. whatsoever. So, um, so what about if you're a clinician and you're trying to break in, what would you say would give you that information? Uh, two places, maybe three. Mm -hmm. uh, just week before last, I had a conversation with AVMA's um, careers group. Yes. And they, they want to do uh, a better job of getting different career opportunities in front of the private practitioner through the Axon system. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be working with them to develop some. Uh, uh, some videos from the different federal agencies so that uh, people who are interested in looking at a broader career that veterinarians can do can look through AVMA's um, Axon uh, careers, uh, I guess, portal mm -hmm. um, and be able to, to see all of the different types of things that veterinarians can do beyond the um, clinical practice. The other thing we're going to have on our website are um, federal job opportunities that are going to be available that everybody can can see. Uh, so it'll be somewhere about halfway down the home page. There'll be a little button that says jobs, and it'll list those jobs that are available to give people and, a sense and, of that. And so people don't have to be members to see that or what? No, that's not going to be uh, behind a, a membership portal. That'll just wow, be- Wow, that's huge. Yep. That is huge. Good for you. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, uh, so it's, it's that and it, and um, the um, Valerie Reagan's group at. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Uh, I'm on her, I'm on her uh, e-list. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they, they do a lot with um, career transitioning veterinarians and that would be another place to look at their website and look for career transition veterinarians and get on their list serve because they also publish uh, job opportunities and they also have uh, webinars on multiple career uh, opportunities. So that's another way to, to look. So AVMA um, and all three of those, by the way, are on our homepage on our website. So if you go there, you can click on any one of those and, and it'll take you to three different places that you can get more information about careers beyond private practice. Oh, that's one area that we certainly are, are looking to bulk up on our website where um, we're, we're so much in the uh, initial stages of, of working on other parts of it. It's kind of like a phased rollout. Yeah. <laughs> so I, but I'm so, so glad to hear that, that, that you guys have uh, specifically addressed um, careers and, and have, are making that information accessible to non-members um, because after all, when they get in those careers, then they become members. Yeah. So that all works out. <laughs> yeah, so, so. Our, our, big, our, our biggest emphasis now is on recruitment and retention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, you know, well, and, you have a very, yeah, yeah you have a very good, a, a very good plan for that. I love that. So um, I myself will be sharing this video um, on a, uh, we'll, we'll be putting this on our website, on our YouTube channel. I will set it up so you can also embed this video if you want it um, over onto your guys's website. And, uh, and it, it uh, will be uh, easy to do. Uh, you could check with me if you have any questions about that. Okay. And then um, I'll be sharing it into some of those Facebook groups that I'm a part of where the younger veterinarians, as I said, or, you know, they're, they're seeking other opportunities. Yeah. And, um, and I, 
I think that I am very delighted to be able to offer this to that to to uh, folks out there who are either thinking of being veterinarians to know that there's so many incredible opportunities in veterinary medicine, mm -hmm. and that they they uh, they don't have to worry, um, like we were told in the. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you, you know, you've got to love veterinary medicine. You really have to love it because it's not going to pay you that well. And <laughs> yeah. Yeah, do you remember? Yeah, that was yeah. a thing. And, um, and so here we are, we're able to say, you know what, um, we have uh, an organization that's even advocating for higher pay um, mm -hmm. in, in federal veterinary positions. So I'm, I'm so happy to hear all of that. Uh, there was, uh, uh, this was an eye opener for me as well. So um, if you have any last words, um, for, for uh, our listening audience at all? I, I think you, the, uh, the sky's the limit for you as a veterinarian. And uh, if you can imagine a position for yourself, you can likely create that position for yourself. I believe it. I think I've heard that a few times over mm -hmm. the course of these interviews that I've been doing. So thank you so much, Dr. Joseph and Ellie folks, he was here today talking to us about his multifaceted career. And this will be posted, um, as I said, to our association website and hopefully on to others as well. We certainly encourage that. And I will be uploading this also to our podcast. And wow. so for those folks who don't necessarily want to um, watch videos, but, per, but love listening to podcasts as they're driving around or what have you, um, they'll have the opportunity to do that. So please like and share, and most of all, subscribe to this YouTube channel. Thank you again, Joe. Excellent. I appreciate You're it. You're welcome. Thanks for doing this. Bye.